And welcome back to Law & Crime. We have a live update right now from our Jesse Weber. He has been covering the jury selection process at Harvey Weinstein's trial. He is live there right now. And uh, Jesse, we want an update on what happened there today. Hey, Angelica. So today marks the first day of official formal voir dire jury selection process. The number has been whittled down to 146 jurors. We knew about that number because at the beginning of the day today, uh, Judge Burke said that both sides agreed to eliminate 63 jurors uh, based upon their questionnaires. So now at the beginning of the day, we were down to 146. And again, the magic number that they're looking for is 18. That's 12 jurors six alternates and what's happening the majority of the morning the media was actually not allowed to be in the courtroom just to make room for these 146 jurors as they, as they went in there and it was during that process both sides were allowed 15 minutes to question each panel of jurors it's about 45 seconds per juror uh, at that point we saw all of the jurors leave the room leave the courtroom and then the both sides made a determination about which initial jurors would be dismissed. Um, right now, there's a lunch break until 2 p.m., but we did see some dramatic moments in the beginning of the day, and this is pretty incredible. The very first thing that happened was one of the jurors was called back into the courtroom, and the judge admonished him for using Twitter, social media, tweeting about the case when he said in his questionnaire he would basically follow the court's orders. Uh, this was a controversial tweet. It was a part of the defense's motion yesterday to try to switch venue and get this uh, case ultimately halted. This jury member has about 7,000 uh, Twitter followers. He wrote an inappropriate comment and the judge said, report back here March 10th, 2020 at 9.30 a.m. I encourage you to have a lawyer present. If you can't afford a lawyer, we will supply one to you because you need to show cause why I should not hold you in contempt of court. The judge said that is 30 days in jail and a fine. He then concluded by saying to him very sternly, very coldly, good luck. And that's the morning that we've seen on top of the fact that the defense also lost their motion to get individual jury sequestration. Basically what the defense wanted was the opportunity to question each one of these jurors individually. In other words, saying that their answers, the topics that they talk about, they don't want those answers tainting the other jury pool members. Don't let anybody know what each jury member is going to answer a question. The judge denied that and said, we'll take it as it goes. So a absolutely a pretty interesting morning, which is what we've come to expect in this case. Wow, that's really interesting about that one juror and the tweets because, first of all, 7,000 followers. Is this guy some sort of influencer or something? You think he would know that uh, he wasn't supposed to be tweeting about the trial as he's there for jury selection, right? Well, our understanding based upon the tweet is he's writing some sort of novel and he was suggesting the Harvey Weinstein trial. I believe someone wrote a comment to that tweet saying something along the lines of, I don't know if this is jury tampering, but I would find him guilty. This juror then liked that tweet, which seems to signify he might think Harvey Weinstein's already guilty before any evidence has been presented. That's so problematic. Now, mm -hmm. I got to tell you, this jury member comes in and is talking to the judge. You would imagine he might be scared, uh, might be a little concerned. He seemed pretty prepared and kind of knew why he was in trouble. And at one point he goes, oh, what, what's the date again that I'm supposed to report back? Okay, pretty matter of fact. I don't know if he was shocked about what happened, but he didn't appear to be so. But yeah, he's coming back to court on March 10th and he better explain himself. Yeah, that's really interesting. And Jesse, you know, you said this, that they have 146 jurors right now. They've got to get this down to 18. Is there any sense there that they will do this quickly? And uh, I know they've scheduled the openings to start on the 22nd. So are we on schedule, do you think? So far, Donna Rotuno actually said earlier we're ahead of schedule. Um, but look, this process, although each side gets 15 minutes, it's not clear how long the attorneys have to deliberate about which jurors they want excused. Uh, wh when do they want to use their preemptory challenges, which is when you could get rid of a juror without cause. There's a strategy here. They brought in a jury consultant today. Uh, and look, you know, what is the magic number that they want to get to today? Do they want to whittle it down to maybe 70, carry it in tomorrow, uh, and then hopefully 
figure it all out by the 21st. I wonder if they could get down to that number quicker than they imagine. Uh, it all depends upon how long this process really will take. Uh, but what we heard yesterday from Arthur Idala is he says opening statements are definitely happening January 22nd. But you know the, the most important thing is that there is another motion being heard in an appellate court right now to determine if this trial should be stayed. Should there be a change of venue? The defense filed that motion saying there's just way too much pretrial publicity that is going to affect this jury pool, and this appellate court will decide if this case is going to continue or not. They've been denied in the past. It seems by all accounts that the defense will be denied once again, and this case will continue, but we can't forget that that's in the background. Right. That was my next question for you. I know that we haven't heard the outcome of that motion yet, but yes, this happened before and they were denied. So any sense if they'll get denied again, do you think? Well, here's the thing. The defense has been denied a lot in this case, uh, both by the J uh, Judge Burke and also the appellate court. But one thing you have to remember, when that decision was made to not change venue or to halt the trial, that's a very different set of circumstances than where we see now. We see what we saw one day with a flash mob. We see protests. We see these jury members coming in. Uh, and again, that flash mob from last week was so loud you could hear the chants in the courtroom during this jury selection process. So we, we did, we're in a different set of circumstances than we see weeks ago or months ago. And perhaps, perhaps that this might be the kind of situation when you need a cooling off period or you need a change of venue. In the defense motion, Arthur Idala said, if this is not a case of change of venue, then really what is? Because this really seems to be the most high profile case we've seen since O.J. Simpson. That seemed to be a strong point in his argument. And as of right now, we're waiting to hear what happens next. And I know the first time around when they filed that motion, the trial could have been moved out to Long Island or up to Albany, which is obviously still New York. But do you think that if this trial were to be moved, it would still be a new, is it still a New York trial or is it elsewhere? And with that, does it even matter? This trial will continue in New York. Uh, the question is, will it be here uh, in New York City? Will it be in Long Island? Will it be in Albany, which, uh, quote, Arthur Idala said, are quieter jurisdiction? Uh, look, will the media follow? Yes, but probably not to the extent we see here. It's very easy to get to this location in downtown Manhattan. Is it so easy to get to Suffolk County? Is it so easy to get all the way to Albany? The crimes happen, the crimes happen here in New York. That's why it's going to be here in New York. Look, it, it, there, there's a part where the defense says they can't get a fair trial, they can't get an impartial jury. There's a 100% recognition rate, uh, basically, through the majority of the jurors that they know who Harvey Weinstein is and a majority of them already know about the uh, allegations levied against them. It's going to be hard unless you get a jury from another planet that doesn't know what's happening here. But the question, of course, is can they be impartial? Are they being honest with the court about their past, about their what they believe, their biases of any kind? Because that's really what both sides ultimately want, an impartial jury. All right, Jesse, and before we let you go, what happens next? Tell us about where we're going from today. Okay, so jury selection is going to be continuing. Uh, that 146 number is going to be whittled down maybe to 70. It's going to continue for the next few days until we see opening statements on January 22nd which is everything. We know here on Law and Crime, we've said it before, that sometimes, and statistics show this, jury members already decide a case based upon an opening statement. They're not supposed to, but they do. And an opening statement is the time for the prosecution to set the stage, tell their story, lay out all the charges. But it might be even a more of an uphill battle for the defense because they have to be likable, they have to have this jury relate to the defendant and say why these jury members should not believe the prosecution's case. The opening statements, highly important, and I imagine that the media and the amount of reporters and attention and maybe demonstrations will be huge on January 22nd for those opening statements. All right, Jesse Weber, thank you so much for this live report. We will, of course, continue to check in and follow any updates coming out of that courtroom. We're taking a break right now on Law and Crime. Stay with us here. Plenty more after this.